This live stream is brought to you by Still and Evergreen Garden Care. Still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools, backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local Still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the best-known and trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. To be inspired and easily create and maintain your garden, head to lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail-order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hi and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Sue McDougall and I'm so excited to be back with you today enjoying the winter gardening. I'm filling in for Trev who I think is enjoying some beautiful sunshine somewhere. So we've got lots to talk about. We would love you to be part of our show this morning or and this afternoon depending where you are in the country and don't forget to put your state and your suburb in the questions because that certainly makes a huge difference. With Australia's varying climate, we have so many different opportunities to explain gardening. And if you're in Darwin today, you're expecting 32 degrees. Now that's not really winter, is it? For the southern states down to 16 across Australia and for those people that have got a chance with a little bit of sunshine, had a wet weekend, I hope you're enjoying the garden or being inspired to set some projects for winter because winter, I always say, is the time of the year that we think get the jobs done because it saves lots of work when it comes to spring. Now, we've got a fantastic show for you to be part of today. Keep joining. We've got so many offers and lots of ideas and inspiration. First up, we'll be chatting to Catherine Clouds. Now, she's an author of Plantastics. Now, if any of you have read books, children's books and thinking about plants and animals and the A to Z, well, this one's one with a difference. You'll love it, I'm sure. Catherine's absolutely passionate about her plants and about really delivering what we've got and the features we've got to our Australian kids. Now, I wonder what inspired her to write it. Be delighted to hear. Now, if you want to get your roses ready for summer, we're in the middle of winter, the leaves are dropping on the roses. The later you prune the roses, I always say the better. So I'll have so many tips on how you can do that and what products you need at this time of the year that's going to make it to ensure, I would say, well, maybe guarantee even your roses are just incredible. Now, Garden Express, join us. I'm talking to my friend, David Van Berkel. I love catching up with him, an absolute passionate horticulturist and grower, sends plants all around Australia. And we've got one of my favourite flowers, and I say it every time I go on a garden tour, I look around, I see the pictures. One plant that inspires me more than ever are the hydrangeas. Now, depending where you grow in Australia, they do brilliantly. Some are for cooler climates, some actually cope in the warmer climates and we're finding out a little bit more about those. We also have four packets of misophotical seeds. I'm going to show you these so you get inspired to put your comment in, um, be part of our show. Oops, upside down, there we are. Four packets of seeds and something I've never given away before for our garden um, live viewers is a tap. Now, I really love the idea of this tap. This is a Dalek tap. Now, it hooks on rather than having a permanent plumbing position, it actually hooks on with a click on fitting to the bottom of the tap. Absolutely love it. Why this hasn't been thought of before, I'm not sure. See this just on with a with a fitting. A great idea. Probably my idea for Monday morning. I think, wow, love that. So, can we inspire you to be in the garden? Remember to include your suburb. In your comments and also what state you live in and hit the like button we love you to be part of our garden gurus facebook live questions are first up i've got also my plan of the week keep listening for that too because oh, every gardener needs one of these as well now let's start off with our question steve what should i be doing with citrus trees and apples right now if your citrus are finished you can put some controlled release fertilizer on them just as the end of august 
always from August to May, they get fed a little bit regularly every year and what, sorry, every month. And what that does is feeds the plants just gradually over time around the drip line. And if they need a light trim, if the fruit's finished on the trees, you can give them a light trim. Apple trees, totally different. So apple trees are pruned lightly at this time of the year. And as they come out of dormancy, they should be sprayed with a cover spray to clear up any insects. But also at the moment that at the begin at the end of August, you feed those that are coming out of dormancy and we can get them flowering and fruiting very quickly. So in Perth, don't have to do a lot until the next four weeks, Steve. So from Belgrave in Victoria, hello Margaret. What are some good bird attracting plants or shrubs to plant in my garden? I just love watching finches and honey eaters enjoying my little garden and I would love attract more. So many kangaroo paws, Margaret, if they do really well, even in pots, they do brilliant. The varieties of grevilleas are second to none. They're incredible. And there's some that suit small gardens and there's some that suit large gardens as well. So the bird attracting plants are always those honey eaters, which just absolutely divine. One small grevillea that flowers all year round, you'll find will attract many many families of honey eaters and they'll be fighting over it and if also you can put a bird bath under it that makes all the difference as well so the birds flit from the grevillea down to the bird bath and you've suddenly got a home for a ecosystem that makes your garden much healthier than others so check them out the kangaroo paws number one also the grevilleas the varieties of grevilleas i'll just absolutely love it any of the adenanthus species banksias love absolutely love um, being in any garden particularly some of the lower growing ones in pots but also the birds love them as well Ver vernina port macquarie new south wales welcome vernina is it okay to put dolomite lime my lawn now and then straight away top with organic fertilizers like blood and bone and pelletized chook poo now if dolomite lime, if you've got quite acidic soil, yes, you can lime your garden now because the rain will wash the soil in. Uh, but And also, yeah, no problem at all. You can put an organic fertiliser on. But if you do it as the weather warms up a little bit more. So if you're in northern New South Wales and it's a little bit warmer and the lawn's coming out of dormancy, yes, you can do that now. Make sure either the rain will wash it in or make sure the rain's washing it in for you. We want to revitalise the soil and the the most important thing is getting that organic matter into the soil to help hold the water, particularly through summer. That increasing that water capacity is so important. If you've got lots of questions, if you've got some ideas, what's looking amazing in your garden, make sure you join us. Put it, all the information in the comments section and we'll read it out throughout the morning. Find out what's happening all across around across Australia. And if you've been in lockdown and you've been inspired in your garden, you've created an incredible project, we would love to hear it. And if you're enjoying the show this morning, don't forget to hit the like button. It's all about just spreading the cheer, spreading the gardening inspiration. And someone I would like to spread the gardening inspiration is in with, I should say, this morning is Catherine Klaus. Now, she's the first guest we've got to join us today. And she's the author of Plantastic. And that's the A to Z of Australian plants. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah so good to chat to you. We, When I came across your book, I just thought, what a fantastic idea. I know my kids grew up with all the A to Z of plants, A to Z of animals mostly, but none of them were Australian animals or Australian plants. Yes. Um, yeah, there's definitely been a movement, I think, for animals probably, Australian animals probably for, you know, quite a while now, but um, definitely recently a movement towards um, connecting kids with Australian plants as well, um, probably starting out of the of gardening and then where it's getting a bit more complicated or, you know, we're getting out into the bush mm. as well. So, Yeah. So what inspired you to write the book? Uh, so I'll tell you the short version of the story. Um, <laughs> I, about it's, It was about three years ago. My kids were about um, three and six and we'd come out of the library with a lot of those books you talk about, about animals and Australian animals. Um, and I love reading those books. I love them. Um, but I did think to myself that day, I'd like to read a book like this um, about Australian plants. And I went home and did a bit of searching and I was really sad to find well, just to discover that there wasn't one, not a not one proper like picture illustrated kids book 
all about Australian plants. So um, I was frustrated for about six months about that. And then I realised if I didn't write something like this, who who was going to write it? Um, and so I just started writing. <laughs> and now, have you have a, do you have an interest or a background in Australian plants? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm, I definitely do. Um, so where does it start? Oh, I, I, my undergrad was in, I focused on plants in my undergrad and then I did honours in, um, focused on acacias. Um, and then I've worked as a consultant botanist um, in Melbourne. And uh, over the last fairly few years, probably six to eight, I've been trying to finish a PhD in, um, in it's a molecular project, but it's focused on Australian plants as well. So that's my background, yeah. Well, well, given that broad background, how did you narrow it down to A to Z? Because I think if someone really sat down with me and said, okay, put your plants in a book, the ones that you think are interesting, uh, I reckon it would be a two-volume encyclopedia. There's so <laughs> much fascination when it comes to our Australian plants. Yeah, it was really hard. So my first, the first thing I realised was I wanted to do, make it very kid-friendly, so I wanted to do it in A to Z format so that, um, it was restricted to that 26 um, plants and um, easy for kids to work through. Uh, but it was very hard to reduce the list. I had to. I I had a few strategies. One was I wanted um, to make sure there was really widespread, really common Australian plants in there, so that kids anywhere in the country could look out their window or in the garden down the road and and hopefully find one. Um, but I also needed to have some really exciting, interesting plants too that might be a little bit less common but have a great story or do something cool. So um, that's sort of how I tackled it to try and reduce the list. <laughs> yeah, that's actually interesting you talk about that connection to down the road because I know great memories as kids, my kids the same, what they read in a book or what they see in a book as a picture, then it comes to life when they see it, when they just walk down the street and puts everything in context, doesn't it? It really does. And I know obviously my kids are a bit spoiled because um, they've got a very enthusiastic native plant person for a mum. But I definitely when I have, I've read my book to the kids, mm -hmm. particularly my daughter, and um, then when we're out for a walk, I, she gets so excited, especially about finding things like mistletoes that are quite, that, that they're in, uh, there's a mistletoe section in my book and they're quite interesting and she loves trying to spot some of these plants now so that's great no, some of your favorites what are some of your highlights uh in the book the um so there's uh, they're all i i have thought about this they're kind of all my favorites but um i thought from a gardening perspective that a few that are interesting and i like are stylidiums um and i had to put that in as s for stylidium because T was already taken. So um, they're interesting because, so they're the trigger plants. So they have um, floral parts that move to um, at this, the kind of set and trigger by a pollinator and um, the pollen will be put onto the pollinators back with this movement. And that's a great one because you can get them from native nurseries for your garden. Uh, but you, they're also super fun for kids because when you find them out in the bush or if you grow them in your garden, they love setting those triggers off. So that's quite fun. Um, that's one. I, uh, another one I was thinking about was um, acacias and, and that's more because you've just got to know about acacias that, um, in Australia. They're so important. And um, right now, I'm very inspired by them because they've just started flowering in Melbourne. Um, so the golden wattle, I've got planted in my front yard and it's just started flowering. So that's a great one. Um, do you want me to tell you any more? <laughs> oh, well, I'm actually particularly, I always think the fascination and it ties in with many kids' passion is the wool of my pine. Yes, the wool of my pine. So that's another one I have included in my book. Um, and this one, so was for the very interesting story. So um I've, you know, shortened it very much so, but explained um, in kid-friendly um, content about the fact that this was finding the wool of my pine in the bush was very much like finding an, a dinosaur today because it was only known from fossil records and presumed to be completely extinct. And yet there it was, a, a ranger in um, New South Wales found it in 1994. So it's... Um, a great one and you can plant it in your garden too so it's a really good one for that oh absolutely fantastic it's inspiring now is this book available all across the country 
It is. I, I've, it's been published through CSIRO and they have been amazing to work with and to get the book out there because for me, it was definitely about just making this book available. I wanted as many kids and as many places as possible to have the opportunity to read about Australian plants. So you can find it in good bookstores and sometimes museums and art galleries. So just go looking or online. Uh, and Catherine, I must ask, have you got a cover of it that you can show us now? Yes, show it up. I do. Put it in front of your Thanks face for the so trigger. Yes. <laughs> Here it is. It's really beautifully illustrated by a local um, lovely illustrator called Rachel Guyon. Um, so there it is. It looks nice and bright. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I love that you've worked with, with a local illustrator to be able to enjoy those flowers and also those plants. It's the seed pods. It's just the interest. It's that absolute passion that I think sharing that love around. And now are there one question just before we let you go. Are mm -hmm. there any ideas for a second volume? I really have a lot of ideas for a second volume. Um, there's just, like you said before, so many good plants. And now um, that we've had, I've had such a good response, now that I can see that people are also out there interested in reading about Australian plants to kids, I am very motivated to write another, another volume. So watch this space. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Fantastic. Catherine, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely inspiring. Now, if you've got grandkids, you've got kids, you've got anyone who has an interest in native plants and loving to read, particularly what's in your backyard, what's in the walk trail that you go to, just enjoy nature. Chase it down. Plantastic. The A to Z of Australian plants. Fantastic story. And uh, why it has taken so long to get an Australian plant book. We're just so grateful that Catherine's been inspiring. CSIRO is a publisher and you can find it at all good bookstores, maybe the library, and just enjoy it. What an inspirational story. And if you've got another book you love about Australian plants and if you can find that when you say those beautiful beautiful books around if you've got something that you'd like to share don't forget to put it in the comment section tell us where you've got it and how much is or how important that is for you now let's head to our questions and answers Andrew from Adelaide I have a three-year-old crab apple tree that needs to be pruned I don't want it to grow too tall but I'm confused as to whether to prune it now and wait until spring please suggest what I should do don't prune it just yet and if you find don't prune it yet because you'll lose the flowers Andrew if you wait until pruning it after the flowers then it will send out its beautiful new growth. So you want with crab apple trees, flowering plums, any of those trees, ornamental trees that are, when I say, growing for their flowers, if you prune them before they flower, you lose them. So let them put on that gorgeous show and then you can prune them and then they'll send out that beautiful new growth. That wood will develop flowers for the following year. Josephine in Victoria, I need a hedge for a west facing fence opposite my double story home. The bed is two and a half meters wide and the wall is seen from living areas. Any suggestions on what to plant? Oh, what a great, great inspiration. What a great opportunity to plant many things so if it's west facing that obviously means it's getting the hot afternoon sun if you can plant photinia josephine if you're thinking viburnum odoratissarum depending where you live that's another beautiful hedge when i say viburnum um, emerald luster is another one that you can think of really strong growing plants that will come up and create a hedge that's going to going to be there for a long term Always hedges are great structures of a garden, I say. So you want to plant something that's going to be there for long term and create a backdrop. And when it creates a backdrop, then you can plant all the pretty stuff in front of it. Hope that helps. Uh, from Victoria, we're going to talk to Heather or answer Heather's question. My agapanthus seems to be getting aphids. I've tried sprays, but they didn't work and it's spreading to each one. I don't get sun in that area at this time of the year. What should I do? Oh, aphids are frustrating. What we want to do is be able to attract those birds that are going to eat the insects as well. So lots of bird attracting plants will make a difference. And you'll find if you can use contact sprays like pyrethrum, you'll find aphids will come, come in very quickly. But there are also, check them out, there are also predatory insects and there's predatory wasps that come into the garden and they lay their larvae in the aphids body 
and then the larvae hatches. So see if you can find some of those around. You want to encourage them. And what happens is that the body of the aphid is mummified. And when you look at your aphid very closely, you might need a magnifying glass, you'll see this shell of an aphid and the aphids died. So increasing the biodiversity in your garden makes a huge difference. Increasing the opportunity to have insect eating birds. You've got a range of different plants and also look after the predatory insects. That will make a huge difference to your garden and there's no aphids there. So the aphids in the shade, of course. So you can be as, as hard as you like getting rid of aphids or as gentle as you like. Sometimes just a high pressure hose will get rid of aphids or squashing them. I often get great pleasure in squashing aphids. Lots of people go, ew but I actually like being able to squash them and get rid of them. <laughs> to Sorrento in Victoria, good, hello Kia. I keep going to say good morning because it's still morning here in WA. Um, any suggestions what to feed my macadamia tree? It used to produce lots of macadamias, but not in the last four years. Now macadamias will tolerate a controlled release fertilizer. Controlled release fertilizer means that you'll have nutrients that are released over a period of time for fruiting trees. And so over this period of time, the plant can get regular feeding through temperature and moisture. So fertilizer is released through temperature and moisture and it's not just dumped all at once, but you'll find there's less chance that you have of overfeeding it and causing a problem. So controlled release fertilizers are the future of fertilizing, particularly in the home garden. And the reason is, is you can make less chance of mistake, there's less leaching of nutrients and you'll find the environment's much happier for it. So look for a controlled release fertilizer for fruiting plants with a low phosphorus rate, phosphorus level, and you'll find that that spread around the base of the tree will make a huge difference at the beginning of spring and the beginning of summer. That will make a huge difference to feed. And we are starting to get into uh, end of August, into feeding time as all those plants come out of dormancy, adding the fertiliser as the soil warms up, depending where you are in Australia, already has warmed up. Um, if you've got some tips on what you do in your garden, don't forget to tell us. We'd be delighted to share them with you, particularly if it's a really good tip and part this advice that you think nobody else can live without or nobody else's garden can live without. If you've got any questions you want answered, put them in the comment section also with your state and suburb. That helps us a lot when it comes to answering specific advice for your particular garden. And don't forget to hit that like button because we would love to hear from you. Now we are heading probably from fruit trees to lawns. What do we do with our lawn at this time of the year? We're going to make sure it's not waterlogged, but also next to the lawns, we're going to look at the flowering plants like roses and gardenias. What do we do with those at this time of the year? Well, with roses, it's the time to prune them. You've got anywhere from late, well, mid July, late July, and talking to a rose grower, we've got you know, a few weeks still to prune the roses. And a tip that I can share with you, I always find the later you prune your roses, the less chance the aphids have to find them. And you'll find depending where you are, you know, your roses might be in full flower, but in the Southern States already, those roses have gone dormant. We can prune them at the moment and we can prune them back. Always, we say, I always say the tip, just get rid of all that messy wood at the top third. Prune off the top third, and then you can actually see what's happening. We want to encourage those beautiful, strong water shoots. Now the water shoots are the beautiful new growth with green stems that are strong. Don't remove those because the idea of pruning a rose is to regenerate the bush. We want to regenerate it so it's a long-term bush. So anything that's really weak, the wood's a bit, a bit, I oh, want to say spindly, not looking good, well, that would remove because I often say you will never get a prize winning flower off a, off a wood that's thinner than a pencil. So always remove that. If there's diseased and damaged wood, prune that out and then get trim back to an out, outward facing bud if possible. Now, if you happen to prune your roses with a chainsaw, I know many people do with a head shears, 
that's okay. You can go through and clean them up. You won't kill them doing that. But if you want beautiful, strong blooms, just a little bit of considered pruning will make a difference. Now, I always say to people, prune, give them a feed after you've finished pruning them. We want to spray them with either white oil or lime sulfur and that's going to clean up any insects if there's new growth already and the weather's a little bit warm i recommend giving them a cover spray with a white oil or a pest oil but if you've got no leaves on them at the all lime sulfur is the plant is the spray to use i know it's used in commercial in commercial nurseries forever makes a huge difference to cleaning up any insects and fungal problems but what do we do to feed them now we've got something like scott's osmocote plus organics now this one's also for roses camellias and azaleas so it's for the eyes it's got the nutrients in it that's going to feed the roses and encourage the plant it's got blood and bone which contains nitrogen it's high in calcium it's got composted manure in here that's going to help improve the soil anyone who's listened to me gardening over the many years i say gardening is all about the soil if you can get the soil right the plants really look after themselves and the hard work's in it so spread this around it's also got seaweed in it it's got all this amazing stuff it's all about all about microbial activity in the soil so put that around around the base of the plant and that will make a difference and also the other thing that's important for something like this this will feed over a period of time I was talking about controlled release fertilizer also feed over a period of time so you won't get really soft lush growth that's more prone to insects and diseases but you'll get really strong thick strong leaves and potassium is the one nutrient that helps not only incredible blooms when it comes to spring but it also helps thickening that cell wall and anyone who's grown roses before and worries about black spot we want really strong healthy growth so there's less problem with black spot and those diseases so you can have the best spring roses you've ever grown so out there maybe with the umbrella if it's raining at your place a bit cloudy actually i don't think there's much rain forecast around the country today so it might be rose pruning day or rose pruning afternoon now i've got another question from margaret margaret from belgrave i have some older azaleas with petal blight what can i do with them one of the things is using potassium also but petal blight is is a real curse once you've got it because you're going to have to just start start spraying with a fungicide that's going to help as the buds color up and when i say as the buds color up it's most important because once we've got it on the flower buds where it tends to spread around so manka z plus fungicide makes a difference potassium makes a huge difference because we want really strong healthy plants so they can hopefully resist the diseases that come through and I find if you've got a row, an azalea crop that has never got petal blight, you will be amazed how, how beautiful or how long those azaleas actually flower for. So we can get rid of those. You'll find that the azaleas looking stunning, looking absolutely stunning. And some of the azaleas in the garden, one thing that we need to need to remember. Now, I've just had a query also in our comments what's the name of the product osmocote plus organics for roses camellias and azaleas you can do that granular fertilizer and you can't overfeed plants with it it's got all that controlled all that good organic matter that's going to improve the soil and make a huge difference gardening is all about the soil now question of the day a good portion of our country is in lockdown has it good portion i think it's over half if you're spending a lot of time indoors there's nothing better than a few indoor plants now for your chance to win a tap or a packet of seeds when i say a tap we need to look at the dalek tap we introduced the show this morning saying i thought this was a product of the day because this has got a click on hose if you've got a spot that you need a temporary tap and you want some sort of stability and not just a handheld this tap's got a great idea. So for your chance to win this, tell us what indoor plants you've got growing in your house. Maybe what's your favourite? You can add that too. And I'm sure someone who's got some incredible indoor plants, I can see them um, framing him this morning. We talk to him every week, David Van Berkel from Garden Express. Hi, David. Hi, Sue. How are you going? 
Oh, absolutely brilliant. Now, I see a few gorgeous indoor plants. Our topic of the day, our talk of the day is indoor plants. I know you and I are going to talk about something else, but are you an indoor plant lover too? Uh, I, I just love them and I'm glad there's a resurgence on them because they've always been around, um, you know, growing up in the family home and then at my own place I've got plenty of them. So um, to see everybody else getting involved and so many of the cafes are doing a great job with some of them as well. So it's just a reminder that, you know, you can have this really enjoyable product, uh, you know, in your everyday life. So, yeah, love the indoor plants. Oh, me too, because there was a time, and you've been in the industry like me for a long time, there was a time that you could not give an indoor plant away and nobody was interested at all. But I grew up with African violets in grow lights. Remember those 70s grow lights, planter poles with all these plants, the smell of fish emulsion <laughs> with the yeah. indoor plants. We have come a long way, really. I remember my auntie's house had a little indoor sort of atrium concrete bit that as you walked in there was a little plants room as you entered the house for, for indoors. So uh, maybe one of those 70s things again. But, um, yeah, they're, they're just amazing, aren't they, that you can have that, that beautiful and now some really vibrant colours. And uh, I remember seeing a plant in Australia for about $4,500 for, for a half a plant. Same plant in New Zealand, $20,000 was paid uh, for an oh indoor. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Us, us growers are thinking, why? Uh, we're a bit silly, aren't we? <laughs> We've missed out. Now, one plant, another one of my favourites, David, and I, and I honestly say this, every time I take a garden tour around, um, I always come back with hundreds of photos of hydrangeas because they really are have such a broad spectrum. We tend to bundle them all together, very different growing conditions. But I wanted to talk to you about hydrangeas. You do have an offer of the week that we'll talk about a little bit. But um, bare-rooted hydrangeas, get them into the garden. Yeah, straight in. Look, this is uh, this is a unique offer that we've got. We we get a selection of uh, of plants where we've been taking some cut flowers, so they're coming out of the equivalent of a two hundred millimeter pot. You know, so it's a fairly substantial plant with a lot of eyes ready to burst into uh, into new growth as spring sets in. So we don't want them to be out of the ground for too long. Um, get them whilst they last. Hot offer, pretty much uh, sold out by the end of this week. Hoping to get a few more in for next week. Uh, but that will be the end of it. It has to be quick and it has to be uh, back in the garden. Um, beautiful so when plant. You say, say they are a beautiful plant, but when you say cut flowers, that's pricked my interest because um, people don't think about hydrangeas for cut flowers. No, look, there's so many things on the cut flower market now that even I wouldn't have thought make a good cut flower, but that industry is probably a few years ahead of, uh, of, of the home garden industry in terms of innovating, you know, and, um, my daughter just asked me, can we get some, some gypsophila in and sell them in pots? And I'm like, that's the old floral bouquet, you know. <laughs> if you had a wedding, you had gypsophila in it. And now I don't think they sell any of it in the cut flower game that much at all. So, um, yeah, hydrangeas, cut flowers, very interesting looking bunch, but, but beautiful just the same if you're not growing your own. Yeah, certainly is. Now, we've got a question from Margaret for yourself and and me, David. I'll um, put it out there. Depending on the variety, I think, of the hydrangea that Margaret's got, she wants to know how hard should she prune it back and are hydrangeas okay with pots with good potting mix? I'd say yes and yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a double winner there for sure. Like you can prune hard probably to about, you know, four or six inches off, off the base as long as you've still got some buds left. At the, at the bottom uh, for the plant to regrow. It's a little bit like you were talking about the roses, you know, you can go really hard. You just want to make sure you end up with a nice balanced plant as you're trimming it, as you're trimming it down. Um, yeah. In pots, it does do really well in pots, substantial pot, top it up with some fresh mix. And of course, a little bit heavier on the fertilizer and the um, and watering during the summer months. And I can guarantee I've got a hydrangea endless summer, David, that has survived the soccer ball it survived the footy it survived all the kayaking gear landing on it still keeps coming back still flowers beautifully and i hardly ever prune that one it's got morning sun in perth does particularly well in a pot it's prone to flooding sometimes drought other times you know typical horticulturalist garden <laughs> and it's still surviving yeah the endless range they're, they're beautiful we have had them a couple of times we'll have them again uh later in the season i believe um, but they're just a beautiful, more sort of compact growing plant. And, and I, I remember on one of my lucky trips to, uh, to Holland that they're selling them in a, in a tiny little like 140 centimetre pot 
but six or eight blooms on top. It, it just it couldn't balance on its own, and it's incredible how they can force theirs through to the, to the blooming like that. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I love the, the endless range as well. Yeah, they do amazing. Now the two varieties you've got, tell us about those because there's a pink and a white. Now these I think are great value. Garden Express offer everyone. Just listen to this. They're valued at twenty seven ninety. Now they're sold at sixteen fifty. So this is a saving of forty percent. That's pretty pretty incredible. If we don't need any more inspiration, tell us about the two varieties you've got, David. Well, the Agnes Pavali White, it's uh, it's one of the good old fashioned um, varieties. You know, really pure, really clean. Uh, and of course, that one will stay white the whole time. The pink variety is called Tosca. And the pink hydrangeas, you can push their colour a little bit more towards the red or across into the blue by adding one of the pH changing agents, So, which we also have online as well. Um, so yeah, the pink hydrangeas is also delicious, will remain pink if you don't do anything, but you can you know vary that colour up a little bit. Um, a little bit later, we'll have a, a much bigger range of, um, of beautiful hydrangeas as well. But these ones, as I say, it's a, it's a special deal. We knock them out of the, uh, of the growing medium, sell it to your dormant. You've got to get it in quite quick. So that's why we do a good price, knock it out there, get the job done, and, uh, and on to the next offer. Yeah, I love that. So you head to Garden Express, check out the Garden Guru's live offer. Now, more information, gardenexpress.com.au. Easy to find, David? Easy to find. Look I've forward to that. You, I just wanted to show it. I was, I was in the warehouse the other day and uh, we had about 40 left of these voodoo lilies. Oh, look at that. Wow. They That's look amazing. amazing. Tell us about those. Oh, voodoo lily. It's, uh, it's the dragon arum. Um, it's the, the flower that has this sort of black flower that smells a bit like, oh, it's a pungent smell. Let me put it that way. That's so, been polite, David. <laughs> I know. It's not for everyone, but, uh, but it was crazy. We happened upon this, um, this selection of really large specimens uh, from a, a local lady, and she was, uh, she was keen to move them on. I saw them flowering, and I just had to have them so we could uh, pass these beauties through to our customers as well. But they're so, not meant for sale, but check it out at gardenexpress.com.au. Uh, they look really good. Put it up again so we can show our inspiration. Voodoo lilies, you've only got about 40 of those by the looks of it. They look like about six plants in one, I think, David. Yeah, look, I, I can't bust these babies off. There's a few more eyes coming. I actually yeah. selected this one to come home with me um, ah. in my garden. But, uh, but yeah, 20, uh, 30 or 40 more left uh, available. I'll look forward to those as well. Thanks very much for your time again, David. Well, I love chatting to you, love catching up, and I think Trevor will join you again next week. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, take care. Now head to gardenexpress.com.au. Our offer of the week are hydrangeas. So Tosca Pink, which is the old-fashioned pink variety, and also the Ang Agnes Pavali. Now that's the white one and that's the variety that stays white. I know many people always chase those. They're bare-rooted, great value, sixteen fifty. Get onto them as well. Maybe put in a voodoo lily or two as well. They look great plants as well. Let's head back. Well, actually, I was going to head back to the questions, but before we do that, I want to share with you today my plant of the week. Now, my plant of the week is, now I'll get, make sure I get that right, is the ornamental or the flowering quince. Now, this plant flowers and flowers and flowers. Now, this is available in a double flowering form or also a white and this beautiful cerise pink colour. And the plant comes out, it's a straggly shrub, it continually flowers and I say it's got these long branches it sends out these beautiful new growth I've gave it a trim this morning and on those bunches of flowers we've got some in full flower some buds still coming and they just keep developing everything you read about them says they've got a very short flowering time but that's actually not true they're drought hardy they're deciduous so they drop their foliage they're a bit wiry the birds actually love them because they zip in and out. They're a great plant to have in a garden for a habitat if you're not looking for native plants. But they get up to about a metre and a half high, flower right through winter. They flower for months. They will still have flowers on in spring and also late spring you'll start to get some flowers. Have a look for them. The ornamental quince or also the flowering quince. They won't fruit but they are just worth any any position in a garden and say full sun 
they'll to cope with drought conditions also plant them in a bunch and they're just beautiful cut flower not so long they don't last such a long time for a cut flower but other than that they do brilliantly ornamental quince or flowering quince it's known as and no matter where you are across the country they're looking absolutely stunning at the moment and thrive on neglect you can see in one of my garden beds that's pretty neglectful these are still looking stunning so we will head to our questions remember our question of the day is what indoor plant have you got in your garden or in your house or your patio or your studio or even your office desk that you absolutely love you wouldn't be without we would love to hear that hear that add it to the comment section and with most of australia around well I say most of australia over half of australia in lockdown i'll give you some tips for some indoor plants that will cope with cool conditions. So, and I'll rattle these off because these are all hardy. We do need to get back to the back to the questions. The rapist palm is a really good one for a low, low light conditions. It's a lady palm, does really well. A spider plant, many of us have lived with spider plants for years. You can't kill them, they grow beautifully. Sansevieria, which is the mother-in-law's tongue, that's one of a really hardy plant. You can even grow a piece of that in a glass vase. So you can have plants growing in a vase. Devil's Ivy, the parlor palm, Chamiodura elegans, which is a beautiful, neat palm. Aspidistra, many of us have got those cast iron plants and you can't kill those. Lucky Bamboo, these all cope with low light positions and also cold positions inside so if you've got a part of a house that's not north facing you find you walk inside and it's quite cool through the winter these are the plants for you and another one the heart leaf philodendron which is also a trailing plant that looks amazing up frames or hanging down over over sideboards or pieces of furniture bookcases or something so i'll go through those again rafus palm spider plant sansevieria Devil's Ivy, Parlor Palm, Aspidistra, Lucky Bamboo and Heartleaf Philodendron. They might give you some inspiration for this week. Don't forget to hit that like button. We would be delighted to hear from you today. Now let's head to the questions for the last few. Caroline in Melbourne. I have a garden that runs the length of our driveway. I have planted standard roses in it and was wondering what mulch to use as it's not very wide. Any mulch is going to make a difference. It depends, even if it's not very wide, it depends. If you find you've got a composting mulch for roses is always a good thing at this time of the year because as the mulch breaks down, it feeds the soil. So if you need something to improve the soil and feed the soil, a composting mulch is beautiful. If you use a mulch that's going to be there for a long time and it's a narrow bed and it goes across to the driveway, just make sure there's something that holds that mulch back. A mulch's job, well in place in the garden is to do two things one is to reduce the evaporation and the second thing is to keep the soil cool so if you can do do another job of a mulch that's composting and improves the soil at the same time that will make all the difference but if you don't like the look of that make sure you put a mulch there that's going to keep that moisture in the soil and keep that soil temperature cool through summer in Hilbert in WA, welcome Rebecca. I'm pulling up my front lawn and I'm planting a native garden. It's south facing with lots of shade. What should I plant? Oh, a subject close to my heart, Rebecca. So what you need are plants that grow as understory plants. So when you look at what's available in the garden centres, you'll be looking at plants that grow underneath in the forest situation underneath those canopy of trees so when we think of dampieras beautiful ground covering canedias are some awesome ground covers i know corazima does brilliantly in the shade hypercalama is another one so the swan river myrtle does beautifully in the shade all those understory plants do fantastic dinella is another one some of the flax lilies are beautiful head to a specialist local garden center that's got native plants that sells native plants and just say this is the situation this is what i'm looking for and there's a huge range of plants that are understory plants that will grow beautifully and you've got a fantastic opportunity to create some really interesting plants you might have heard our interview um, earlier on 
this morning with the author, Catherine, the author of a fantastic book. She was talking trigger plants as well, stylidiums. They're the sort of plants that you need, some of those little perennials that add interest because that's where they grow naturally um, underneath the shade. So you just replicate those natural conditions in your own garden and you'll have a huge range that will look be looking beautiful. Now we've got Josephine who joins us from Victoria. Should you fertilise bare root and roses in pots? Definitely feed them in pots. If you've put premium potting mix, Josephine, in your garden, oh, sorry, in your um, pot, and you've put bare rooted roses in, there's enough fertiliser in the potting mix for about the first four to six weeks. So once they're bare rooted, I always say you've put them in there, you've allowed them to settle in for a few weeks, and then always as a general guide, always at the beginning of the every season, a controlled release fertilizer around the top of the soil, and that's going to release their nutrients between with temperature as well as moisture. So controlled release fertilizer, but start some liquid fertilizer as well. Over the foliage, you want to encourage beautiful, strong new growth. So nothing that's going to give you amazing leaves. You want a balanced liquid fertilizer for foliage, uh, sorry, for flowering plants as well. We want to encourage or thicken the root system to strengthen that. We also want to think, thicken the cell walls and build the plant's natural resistance to disease. That's what you're doing, particularly for the first season, to get them nice and strong and healthy and create that framework. And of course, have the best blooms you possibly can. From, from Victoria, we're heading to Epping in Victoria. I have a peace lily plant for a while now, but it's never any flowers. Just wondering why. I feed them with sea salt every now and again. Probably a little bit to do with the light, Jen. If you can put it in a light position, you'll find they will flower beautifully. If it's a bit warmer, they will flower also. And then when you use sea salt every now and again, that's going to help improve the soil. But if you can use a fertilizer as well, that makes a difference. So a fertilizer for flowering plants, you can use controlled release. If you don't like the smell of the organic ones inside or take it outside and put an organic foliar feed over the foliage and then just drench the rest of the fertilizer that you've added around the root system, let it drain and bring it inside. You can't overfeed them at this time of the year, particularly as the weather warms up, you can help initiate some flowers. But if it's in a very dark position, are very shy of flowering. What indoor plants have looked amazing and that you're absolutely in love with, can't live without, was our question of the day. And that's it. We have our winners of the question of the day. Our tap winner, Josephine, lots of indoor plants, including Persian Shield. You're getting this tap. Fantastic. I hope that helps your garden. And our seed winners are Caroline, who answered maiden hair. Now that's one of my favorite indoor plants also. Andrew, Sansevieria's, I'm with you, Andrew. Melody, money plants, yeah, hopefully brings the money in um, to your house. And Eurisha, you've got umbrella trees. And umbrella trees, that's a good one for a dark spot, particularly a dwarf umbrella, because they are so hardy and do really well. So if you want something that's a bit taller to fill in a corner of a room, or you've got an atrium, you want something with some height, that's a great tip. Thanks for letting us know about that one. The umbrella trees do really well. That's it. That's it. Goes so fast, doesn't it? That's it for today's episode of the Garden Gurus Live. Thanks you for joining us. Thanks to the team who puts this show together. I know you can't see it, but there are many of you. Um, we appreciate it, and there's many people around um, in behind the scenes at the Garden Gurus who make this actually happen. We love to deliver gardening inspiration to you every week. Make sure you like us because hopefully that can share more information around to the people who are part of our gardening inspiration and I should say our gardening family. Lachlan will send you a message to our prize winners if you're one of the prize winners after today's show. And the Garden Gurus is back so soon. It's going to be back on your TV very soon watch this space. I'm sure Trev will tell you about that in the coming weeks. Remember, you can always jump onto our website and catch up on our previous stories. There's so much information um, when it comes to the garden and also previous stories from the Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or YouTube channel. Check that out. Make sure you subscribe to that 
thegardengurus.tv. And you can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Audible. Now, don't forget, Trevor will be back next Monday. Make sure you tune in at 12 Australian Eastern Standard Time. In the meantime, enjoy your garden, everyone, and hope you have a fantastic week. This live stream is brought to you by Still and Evergreen Garden Care. Still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools, backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local Still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the best-known and trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. To be inspired and easily create and maintain your garden, head to lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high-quality, German-made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page.